This episode is sponsored by SatelliteLifeCoaching.com, providers of your personal and professional coaching needs. This podcast is also sponsored by HikaOnline.co.uk, creators of culturally specific education resources that engages your child to succeed. You're tuned in to another episode of The Coaching Lounge with your host, Rebecca Gordon, lead life coach at SatelliteLifeCoaching.com. Listen to interviews with creative thinkers, motivational speakers, models of success, and key people of influence. Tune in, relax, engage, and transform your life now. Here's your host, Rebecca Gordon. Welcome to the Coaching Lounge. If you listened to a recent podcast, you would have heard Grant Connolly talk about self-acceptance and living from internal peace. Today, we're continuing the theme of self-love with my guest, who is a mental health practitioner, psychotherapist, counsellor and visiting lecturer. Michael Apoku Fofie is on a mission to co-create and collaborate to address change and to assist people with the changes they experience in life. So as you can imagine, it's a big topic and we won't touch on every aspect of mental well-being today, but I do hope to unearth some great insight into a topic that perhaps is still a taboo in some ways and is well worth exploring in the setting of the coaching lounge um, with our expert so that we can actually just get some insight and support and some help um, with how we can be in control of, I don't know if that's the right word, or to support ourselves in our own um, mental well-being. Michael, welcome to the coaching lounge. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. Thank you. Okay. Now, Michael, um, let's just talk about your surname, Apoko Fofie. Tell me the history, please. Uh, the history is uh, my father came from Ghana, um, west coast of Africa, and he met my mum, who is Guyanese. Um, so whenever I was told or asked about where I come from, I would always mention both Ghana and Guyana because I think they are both important to, to me as a human being. Absolutely. I mean, Apoku is a very strong name, and I recognize mm. that as coming from Kamasi in, mm. in Ghana. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, I think the town that um, my father grew up in, it was about 80 miles outside of Kamasi. Right. Okay. I've been there and it's a really nice place. I've got mm. um, some great friends there. Yeah. So um, I'm very keen for us to actually explore um, mental health. I actually want to touch on um, a few um, topics that, you know, are linked with that. Okay. Um, but just for our listeners to understand, you know, your background, sure. can you tell me about life before becoming a mental health practitioner and your journey to working in this field, please? I think that's a really interesting question, primarily because I think on so many levels I've been involved with mental health on some way or some form. Um, I started working as a as a project manager at a internet cafe in Woolwich back in 1998 and uh, I had a number of really interesting conversations with people, young people that used to engage with the space and trying to get access to the internet. I can remember one moment where I was having a reprimanding session with this with a young person who was just basically out of order. Um, and I took him outside and I had a really strong conversation with him. And the people next door, they were a lighting firm um, next door, came up to me after I had the conversation with him um, and said that they really respected how I was able to address all of the things that he had done wrong. And I didn't try and make him feel 
too bad. Um, and I spoke to him like he was an adult. And I really took something from that. Um, from being a project manager in an internet cafe, I then became a basketball coach. And a number of conversations that I had with various different um, people that I was coaching basketball really helped me align with how important it is to have a de deep degree of respect for the individual that you are coaching, but also respect for yourself and the conversations that can happen as a result of you engaging with others. Um, from me coaching, I went into mentoring. Um, I worked in a girls school in Peckham and then um, a boys Catholic school in in Wandsworth, um, London, South West. And again, um, a lot of really engaged conversations would happen um, around the idea of not specifically mental health, but thinking about oneself in a more positive way to realign, refocus, and readjust um, issues that perhaps weren't going right for the students that I was working with. Um, so much so that yeah, I was a favorite mentor um, and students would often want to come out of lessons to work with me primarily because they valued the level of respect that they were given. And as a result, aspects of their lives would change in the school for them to do well, do well at exams, pass coursework, etc. Mm, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you've made a really big impact in the lives of young people. So is it young people? Yeah, that I, I, you, sorry, carry on. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that I, I think that I was instrumental, um, informative, um, but uh, those young people were able, they're change agents in their own lives to create right. the change. So I, I, was, I was just a facilitator. Yes, yes, yes. That is the yes. right word, really, because actually um, it's guiding mm. and um, drawing out from within. Yes. Agency, it's supporting the person to do that. Absolutely. And you've actually got experience of working in a, in a good range of settings as well. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. Which is yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. So tell me then, I mean, are you mainly coaching young people still or are you coaching adults? Um, I, I gave that up around about five, six years ago. Um, so I'm no longer coaching basketball anymore. I still have a passion for the game, but there's just not enough time. Um, I'm currently working for together for mental well-being um, full time. I'm, as you mentioned, I lecture and I am a visiting lecturer at a um, University of Greenwich. And I also have my own private practice. So at the moment, I'm a bit pushed for time. Yeah, I'd, love yeah. to, I'd love to do it, but yeah. It's just not happening right, right now. Right. And what are you lecturing in? Um, so I support an experiential group, which is kind of like a process group for students that are on their first year of the master's program, which I actually completed around about five, four or five years ago. Um, and they can essentially talk about issues that they are going through. Um, so it's not exactly group therapy, but it enables them to kind of discharge the learning that they've experienced throughout the day, throughout the, yeah, throughout right. the week. Yes. Um, and then they can kind of get some degree of support from others who are also going through a similar experience. I see. So um, before we go into um, a question from our listener and some other questions that I want sure. to ask you, sure. um, I just need to check with you because you are... Um, I don't want to use the word busy. You're very productive. You know, you've got productive. a lot going on. I like yes. That. yes, productive, yeah. yes. How do you take care of your well-being? That's a, that's a really important question. And I think it's a case of um, having a really neat timetable um, and addressing things as well as you need to within a specific period of time. Um, I think for me, it's about healthy practices, eating well, uh, meditating. Um, every time I wake up in the morning, I have a small stone that I touch and I just say thanks. Thanks to the universe for essentially giving me another day on the planet to be impactful with. And from then, um, yeah, I just get on with my day. Mm -hmm. um, gratitude is actually very important, isn't it? We Absolutely. take it for granted Absolutely. that we're you know, able to open our eyes or able to yeah. jump out of bed. And, Absolutely. you know, it's about um, those things that matter. Um, you actually have a very calming and gentle, um, you know, way about you. I can feel that energy coming through, which I'm sure is very, you know, useful in your practice. 
Um, mm. Have you always been that way? Well, I'm laughing here because um, <laughs> I, I want to say yes, but I don't recognize at the time that I have not been reflective and pausing. I, I think uh, I hadn't been up until I started doing Kung Fu um, at around by age 11 um, and noticing how important it was to be quite precise with body movements um, and thoughts that then can either create or be destructive um, mm -hmm. and recognizing that actually it is up to me how I wish to use my body. Uh, and I think from there, life has become much more tempered. I think that's the best way to okay. describe it. Okay, okay. No, that, that's good. I'm sort of like um, interpreting that as discipline leading mm -hmm. towards inner peace. Yes. Because you're having, Absolutely. you know, you're using your mind to mm. have that control of your yes. physical physicality, Absolutely. which um, has some impact on the inner self, really, which I think is important Absolutely. for us to discuss as well, because we yeah, can be so, absolutely. yeah, just getting on with life and not really thinking, mm. actually, let's just pay mm. attention to, to yeah. me and my space. Mm. So um, for me, um, one of the things that helps me to rebalance is to actually just take time out and just yeah. sit and do nothing and mm. write actually is one of the ways mm. that I can actually just feel. Because sure. um, sure. I think it is important to go through all the re's, you know, the rebalance, renewal, you know, resurgence. <laughs> yes. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So um, I'm now going to raise a question from a listener called okay. um, Kizzy. Okay. And she sent this, this question in. Um, I sent out a message um, to my listeners to say that um, I was inviting questions for your show, Michael. Mm -hmm. So um, Kizzy has won a book called The Little Book of Energy Medicine, which is today's mm -hmm. giveaway. Mm -hmm. So Kizzy, I will be in touch to get your details so that I can post you the book. And if you'd like to receive a free giveaway yourself as the listener, um, please email me on rebecca at thecoachinglounge.co.uk. Um, you'll be added to my questions for guests email list. And a few days before each podcast, I'll drop you a mail so that you can actually send a question in if the topic is pertinent for you. So Michael, here's Kizzy's question. Um, she says, everyone has some form of mental health as we all have different thresholds for coping. Sometimes mm. mental health goes out of balance. So why is it that some people think of mental health in a negative way and panic when their coping mechanisms break down? That's a really good question, Kizzy. Um, I think for many people, it's about control and what is manageable especially when things are out of control, it can feel that all of life is unmanageable. And perhaps it's just a case of taking time to reflect, taking time to have a conversation, to bring back, and I think you mentioned this really well, Rebecca, balance, um, which can refocus an individual. I think for me, um, understanding what mental health is and what mental illness is for, is really informative about somebody can have quite a serious mental illness like, like schizophrenia, mm. but have the ability to function well within the frame of what schizophrenia has, has offered them or they are living with in that they are able to have really good conversations, um, have great family support, have a purpose in their lives. So they are able to get out and either volunteer or, or work. Um, yeah. And support mm -hmm. others. And mm -hmm. I think that can be quite conducive to having a better form of mental health. I think it's, about really balancing and coming back to a degree of balancing for the individual who might have a moment a momentary lapse of a judgment or feeling like life is out of control and resetting. I think you mentioned this before, resetting oneself so that you can go again. You can kind of think, well, what's going wrong for me? 
in this moment yeah right i mean that's a great question to ask yourself you know mm. um can i just say then um for someone who is um feeling low depressed or you know in a in a in a real um bad way ha- with how they feel um as the person who's observing that you know it might be that you say, okay, you know, you'll get through this moment, you know, try to help them to see the positive things in life. It's not always mm. easy to help someone to actually see that or, or, or to no. move into that space. What yeah. is the best thing to do? I think, best, I, I think the best thing to do would be just to take a, a few moments out. Um, I listened to your, your podcast about getting off the treadmill, um, oh, right. which was powerful, yes. really, really powerful. Oh, thank you. Primarily because you were setting up this idea that, you know, if you're not checking your Facebook, if you're not checking your Twitter, if you're not on your LinkedIn, and you're not letting other people know how how well your life is going, something's wrong with you or something's wrong with this picture. And I think perhaps just taking time out, getting in tune with how one feels about oneself, one can then think how good is it for me to continue with the life path that I've been continuing for the last X amount of years uh, that hasn't been beneficial to either me, my family, my friends, my my commitment to work, etc. I think once you put a pause in, uh, then there's an opportunity to rethink through just about everything yeah and it's and it's about pause yes absolutely i I do definitely um resonate with that Mm. um it's sometimes a case of just stepping off the treadmill for a moment (laughs) to catch your breath isn't (laughs) it (laughs) absolutely yes it is yeah and what about for the person on the receiving end who's around someone who has a family member perhaps who's quite in a low state what's the best way Mm -hmm. for them to interact with that um individual i think all you, all you can do is be willing to engage with the difficulty, um, perhaps even naming it. Um, I know you feel a bit low. Or how about we go for a walk? I'm a great uh, protagonist when it comes to going out and having a walk with somebody because things shift when you are creatively engaged with, with another person. Mm. Uh, you have a service which is relating to walking counselling, don't you? That absolutely, I do. Yeah, I do. yeah. That that sounds so beautiful to be in the experience of that because yeah. we can get so much from nature. Do you use absolutely. nature in your counselling? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Okay. Yeah, I do. Uh, I just think it offers all the time i think it can be so informative um like you've mentioned creative intuitive um and it's about the individual that you're working with also being aware of themselves their physicality how they are feeling in that moment that can create subtle changes so that when they go back to the situation they begin thinking about themselves and the situation in a in a different way Right, okay, excellent. I'm actually going to um, read some information um, relating to research I gathered um, from the Mental Health Foundation. And their research revealed that in the UK, 70 million days are lost from work each year Mm. due to mental ill health. So Mm. that could be anxiety, depression, and stress-related conditions, making it the leading cause of sickness absence. Yeah. So I need to ask you, Michael, because um, I'm making a little bit of an assumption here mm. that being away from work due to stress, I mean, this is what this research tells us, is that it's mm-hmm. a biggie here for a lot of yeah. people. So I'm assuming that someone listening to this recording right now is perhaps in that situation. Um, mm. Let's talk about the employer side of things. There, there's sure. supposed to be all this, um, you know, new well-being initiatives that are in a lot of workplaces mm-hmm. these days. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't quite know if employers are actually getting it right <laughs> yeah. or, or yeah. if this new well-being thing in workplaces is just a, a lip service. Yeah. But I do need to ask, what can employers do more 
you know, if, if there's a fast paced, challenging um, environment mm. that people are working in, you know, everyone's got KPIs and targets to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can, well, if you're self employed, it might be a bit different in terms of your quotas mm. to, to get for each mm. day or week. Absolutely. But what can employers do more of to support individuals in a challenging environment? I think there is a great space for listening um, that perhaps many employers, primarily because we are living in this fast-paced economy where things change quite quickly. Um, you know, we've had the big presidential election, which I'm sure has sent out, sent out a number of ripples across the world. And, and that's the economy that we are currently living in, where things are just changing on a huge level. Yeah. Very, very, yeah, very, very fast paced. And so as an employer, putting out that you will be willing to listen to people who have or are experiencing difficulties would be a good start. And then actually inviting the individuals who are experiencing difficulty to have a sense of autonomy where they can present you with a number of things that they can do to create better well-being. I'm currently going through um, a book that I, I would recommend to just about everybody. It's called Wellbeing. It's written by Carrie Cooper, okay. um, who has spoken quite specifically about good well-being within workplaces and what employers can do to facilitate a better way for employers, employees, um, to facilitate collaboration, um, mm -hmm. a sense of creativity, a sense of playfulness, mm -hmm. but also getting the job done. Right. I think, I think for anybody who has felt low at work and feels that work is mm -hmm. the problem, I would want them to open up to another and perhaps look at some of the pressures that they are going through that might be adding to the problem that they are experiencing mm. for them to kind of begin thinking about ways out of the solution. And I, I, I doubt very strongly that it is specifically the job. There might be things in the job or the role that are causing a degree of difficulty. And perhaps if those things were just manage differently if mm -hmm. it was let's say um, a superior in in the workplace or another colleague there are things within that colleague that are somehow triggering you and perhaps beginning to question what is it about that other person that is triggering something in you might begin learning about yourself not so that yeah. you put the blame on the other person yes mm -hmm. there is a reason that they are triggering you triggering you but actually, there's something in you that you recognize perhaps needs to be just realigned. Mm -hmm. And nice. sorry. No, yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I, mean I, could, yeah. I could talk on this topic, I think, a lot. Yes. I mean, for me, Together is a great place to work because it's, it's given me an understanding that actually having a space for reflection every month where you can kind of talk about your work with colleagues, you can also talk to a supervisor about your work, and it's not going to go back to your line manager unless there are serious concerns, is a great investment of time mm. that kind yeah. of allows you to move differently with nice. a, your work and then your responsibility mm. and then your sense of autonomy. And it just goes from there. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with you 100%, Michael. Um, what I do want to bring in here is, and I'm going to ask for any employer, you know, whether you're an employer of a small company or a larger company, please drop me a line and let me know. Because I think, um, I agree with what you're saying, but I do actually feel that employers themselves are too close mm -hmm. in the workplace with the mm -hmm. employee. Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, they're, they're, you know, probably more subjective than objective. Right. Yeah. So I yeah. feel because sometimes, um, you know, companies have their in-house coaching set up. Mm. But I think that it requires an outside person who's removed from maybe mm -hmm. the politics or the dynamics or yeah. can look at things fresh and who yes. can walk the person through. So mm -hmm. I would, within an organization's, organization's well-being set up, um, encourage employers to bring in an external expert 
who can um, do exactly as you've said. <laughs> yeah. um, because I think supervisors, uh, supervisors and the, the managers themselves have their own KPIs mm. and targets mm-hmm. and stresses yeah. and, and press, yeah. um, you know, pressures. Yeah. And um, that, that, that's actually um, from a personal experience as to mm. why I, I'm, I'm yeah. sort of like bringing this in here now. Sure. No, I, I totally agree with you, Rebecca. Yeah, 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 yes. But what essentially um, you're saying is that um, there has to be a space where someone yeah. can actually um, yes. start the process of getting yes. the balance. Yes. So um, I myself and you, I'm sure, um, I've worked specifically with people who have entered coaching um, just for that reason, to actually attain mm. the goal of a better work-life balance. So mm. what are some practical things that people can do to attain a work-life balance? Um, or I should say to attain balance in work and in life and in sure. their mental well-being in sure. the demands of life? Again, really useful question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a vehicle like one of my, my clients uh, that I walk and talk with. Right. And I think they have a useful way to see things. There are things that perhaps they would like to fine tune Mm -hmm. and hone. Um, They have a capacity to write beautiful poetry. Mm -hmm. And so there's a degree of creation um, that is happening for them on a regular basis. There is also the capacity for that individual to um, talk to others, whether it be family members or, or friends, not necessarily about issues and concerns, but also about, you know, positive aspects for themselves in their world and also hearing from others about what's going on in their lives too. So it's a collaboration between a number of individuals. I think that can be really supportive Mm, for for anybody. Um, When we bring it back to work, it's a case, again, of finding a similar mindset of individuals that you can share aspects of yourself with, and they can do the same with you, too. Mm. And so, again, there's a degree of collaboration and support that's extended into the workplace, and you can take that away with you and know that you've got people who've got your back. It's yeah. as simple as that. That's, yeah, That's great. That's a mm. really good response. Thank you very much for that. Sorry. Um, what we're going to do now, Mike, is just have a very short break. Sure. Um, we'll be back on the other side of the okay. announcements. All and right. when we come forward, we're going to go a little bit more now into um, social media, which you've already touched sure. on. Sure. And we're going to talk about some other um, situations regarding uh, maintaining uh, a vibrant mental health. Mm. Um, so please Please stay tuned. We will sure. be back shortly. We'll be right back after these short announcements from our sponsors. If you're like me, you'll want to introduce your child to educational resources with images that represent their African worldview, nurtures their confidence, and advances their learning. What you want is a service that provides resources and worksheets to embrace your child's culture and empower their identity. If you are a parent or guardian who wants to homeschool, or supplement the school experience. Subscribe to Hika Online's low-cost, easy-to-access content that will keep your child entertained and wanting more. Help your young person celebrate their uniqueness and encourage them to succeed. Join hikaonline.co.uk today and get your educational resources with an African worldview. In today's fast and demanding world, how much time is devoted to you Partner with Satellite Life Coaching and have the space and freedom to enrich your life. In a few hours, you will move from just thinking about your dream to actually living it. Not only will you get one-on-one time with your professional life coach, you will also get instant access to life-transforming coaching tools. The best part is that you can experience all of this at an affordable fee. Ready to start designing your new life? Go to SatelliteLifeCoaching.com and book your free initial session now. I'm Rebecca Gordon, and my guest is Michael Opoku Forfia, who is with me today, and we are discussing um, issues and situations around um, mental well-being and mental health. And um, Michael's um, touched on... um, 
you know, one of the things that as a coach, um, I know, and I know you know, Michael, is very important, which is to talk, you know, one of the things that people want is to be heard, you know, to be listened to and to express themselves without feeling judged. Um, yeah. so, you know, you're, you, you, you've got a really valuable service here, which, um, mm-hmm. I know many people are benefiting from. So if you can tell me then, what are some of the experiences that stand out for you in terms of some of the clients you've worked with? Uh, a standout client for me will always be, uh, a gentleman I worked with in prison, um, he was, this is his fourth or fifth time within incarceration. He'd served time in um, Indonesia, served time in Australia, served time in Canada, and here he was in the UK also serving time. So he was an international right. uh, yeah. um, person who had been incarcerated. And his main issue was that he he described himself as a, as a drug binger, not a drug user or somebody who abused drugs, but just that he was a drug binger. And these binges would have him act out in a way that were hugely damaging towards himself as well as others. I think for the reason that he was brought into prison this time around, um, he smashed some bottles in a um, in an off license with the aim to rob the person in the in the off license to take the money and basically go out and buy some drugs. Mm-hmm. Why did this individual? His name's not Laos, but I have termed him Laos. Okay. Um, to protect his name yes. and his identity, yes. uh, changed me as a as a counselor primarily because I had this huge store around a person centered perspective, and that's all I really wanted or felt that I could do. With him, I had to go a lot deeper, a lot differently in terms of my approach towards him. There were aspects within his family. So we're talking about a systemic approach, uh, things about transactional analysis that began coming up as a result of our work, things that were essentially about the shadow self. um, And we're looking at more psychodynamic presentations here. And so with these four approaches, Mm -hmm. I was able to kind of begin opening up a number of doorways through which he could have, uh, we only had six sessions, Mm -hmm. could have walked and begun reshaping his life, especially around um, addictions and using drugs and Mm -hmm. having a degree of... uh, Self-presence, self-preservation. Um, yeah, mm. it was it was a really powerful piece of work, primarily because it changed me from being just person-centered into a more open, integrative um, practitioner. And if I could find something that would work with an individual, that maybe for that one session, mm-hmm. I would I would then be able to access it and help them along their journey right i see and is six sessions enough generally (laughs) in 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 the prison um i can understand that perhaps it needed to be so primarily because attachments would then form it'd be difficult to break the attachment with an individual for right or for wrong Mm -hmm. and so as a result it was just six sessions and the work ended had I been working with the individual for privately, I would definitely not have done six sessions. If we could have done a year, it would have been a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's very deep, isn't it? I mean, coaching. Hugely. Yes, yes. coaching supports the, the the person from here moving forward. Yes. Um, but with your service, the counselling, um, it is counselling primarily, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, yes it's it is. sort of like from a lot of back work yes. and work from yes. the past and issues mm. that yes. really have to be dealt with for there to be closure. You know, Absolutely. otherwise, I suppose there'd be a lot of um, kind of worms being opened. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, okay. Yes. So yes. let's just talk about um, your work before when you've had exposure to young people and mm. um, supported their process of, you know, sure. moving through, you know, sure. um, the intricacies of being a, a young person. Mm. Um, in today's world, we have this thing about social media, about Facebook, about, you know, 
as we've yeah. said be- before, you know, posting all these things to show what you're doing, yeah. being the best. Yeah. Yes. So um, it seems to me that everyone wants to show the am- amazing and adventurous lives that they are living mm. out mm. through social media. Yeah. But I think if we take a step and look back on it, it's a case of it can lead us to judge ourselves based Absolutely. on how we feel others perceive yeah. us. And yeah. there have been some reports written to say that, you know, this social media world that we're living in is really damaging um, the mm-hmm. mental well-being and mental health mm-hmm. of young people. Yeah. So what can um, guardians or parents do to support young people in that respect? I think validating exactly the experience that somebody might be having with regards to their addiction to uh, social media. Um, I, I'm using addiction primarily because I do see, especially my, my, my own children, um, have technology as a right. It's their right to access technology. And I question that. I, I often invite them to think about it the, the attraction towards either TV or their tablets and playing various different video games, it, it can be detrimental to collaboration and communication, primarily because you're stuck in a world uh, that isn't real. It's real for the individual who's playing at the time mm-hmm. and then taking them away from it. There's a degree of... It's it's like they go into a catatonic rage mm-hmm. <laughs> where yeah. they they can't live without it for the five or ten minutes that you need for them to do something else, and whether it's them brushing their teeth, them mm-hmm. going upstairs and tidying their room, or whatever it might be, or go, going outside and jumping on a trampoline or playing with their friends, mm-hmm. the the thing that's in front of them appears to be the most important, and that's not true uh the most important thing for themselves is them and how they think and how they feel and actually their relationships with others their parents friends cousins aunties uncles you name it uh, is actually the thing that's going to hold them up when things might perhaps not go so well, either at school or with girlfriends, boyfriends, etc. It's those relationships that can be supportive, not the device that you're plugged into. Mm. But it's hard to um, detach, isn't it? It is. It is. And I think there's a number of steps that we as parents, we as you know, loved ones can invite the individual to begin thinking about and it's a case of being more critical in our thinking around all of these these attractions and that's essentially what they are they're they're an attractive way to live with our world especially with regards to things that we feel that we can't control whether it be politics or money or how well we're not doing at school or are doing within social in, engagements with others this one thing whether it be again this one thing, whether it be, you know, sending a number of messages to a number of people on Snapchat or Google or whoever, whatever you may call it or name it, is a way of controlling an environment. But actually, it's if you look at it realistically, it's controlling you. Mm-hmm. And that's all it's aim is to do for you to be plugged in, for you to think that actually you're engaging with others to an extent but actually, it's the whole device that's managing, controlling your attention, your thoughts, and your sense of well-being about self. Mm. You've articulated that beautifully, Michael, because it has to be said, doesn't it? <laughs> and sometimes these conversations are quite, um, you know, unpleasant or yeah. a parent or guardian yeah. might not yeah. know how to say this yeah. to, to, to a young person, but mm. it does need to be said, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you for that. It's all right. So um, let's move on here um, because we've only got a short amount of time left. Sure. What is emotional intelligence? Wow. I think for me, it's about 
being able to name feelings. It's about being able to know how you are feeling. And if, let's say, it's a, it's a big, heavy emotion, um, perhaps you're low in mood, being able to call it upon it and say, well, this is how I'm feeling at this point in time. But with most things, they don't last forever. They perhaps may last for a half an hour max. And it goes through an intense state and then a low state, as in you might not feel that thing so much at this point. And then you can feel other things that you might be able to feel happy or, or joyful or grateful or appreciative, in love, not in love, you name it. You could feel a number of other things as well. And perhaps emotional intelligence is just about being open to a, a range of different emotions. Mm. And um, I mean, I'm asking a lot of questions here because, you know, I, I love my conversations with my guests because it's sort of like a therapy for me, <laughs> mm. really, in a way. But, you know, I don't always get the chance to ask an ex expert. Sure. But I, I do need to ask you, I mean, I know, yes, I'm a, a life coach, you know, I, I'm a lot of other things beside that, you know, mm -hmm. a mother, uh, um, I, I work, I, I have my practice here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I know the things to do to keep myself positive and happy and upbeat and everything like that. Sure. But I do sure. feel a bit low sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is it okay to say you feel low? You know, yeah. someone says, oh, how are you? You know, because <laughs> I think sometimes... We, we do feel a pressure to pretend. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, of we're course. told, you know, act as if and what have yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, I think real life, um, for me, you know, sometimes I do say, actually, I'm not feeling 100% today. But tell yeah. me what your thoughts are on that question. Again, you've, you've asked a, a brilliant question. It is okay, of course, to feel low. Um, I think we may need to be careful as to who we are sharing that information with. Very true. I think also it's about a timing. Uh, when we are going into work or when we are at work and somebody comes across you and it's not a deep connection that you have with that person, they ask, oh, how are you doing? Will you and that point depending on how you feel, share that actually you don't feel so great, especially if it's not somebody who you are that particularly concerned with or they are concerned about you. Would you share with them at that point? I wonder. It would be best if you could share that actually you don't feel so great and the reasons as to why you don't feel so great, even if you don't know why you don't feel so great. But that person might not be ready to catch catch that, to mm -hmm. capture that, to okay. work with you on that. And so we may have to be mindful of who and where and when we share that information with. Not that you shouldn't share it. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that at mm -hmm. any point. What I am putting forward is that we might need to be a little bit more mindful as to whom we share that degree of emotion with excellent thank you so much that's okay and um if you are in an environment which is perhaps um you know a bit toxic and verging on you know a little bit negative mm. um we are energetic beings here so you know we, we, we have emotions as you as Indeed. you said so yeah. what are some things that people can do to protect their energy that's a, that's a brilliant question. A brilliant question, Rebecca. What can people do to protect their energy? Be aware of energy drains or energy suckers, mm -hmm. primarily because they feed off of other people's high spirits. And perhaps we can limit the amount of time that we are around individuals who we do feel drain us to a degree. Maybe five minutes is enough. And then we can say, look, I really I have to go or I really have to you know, answer that telephone call. Or I really need to go to the bathroom, whatever it might be. You don't want to necessarily cut those people off. Mm -hmm. They have a purpose and place within your life for a period of time. But there is a degree of needing to protect self and invest 
resting time in self, perhaps doing some reading, perhaps doing some meditation, perhaps doing some Tai Chi, perhaps doing some dance to excite ourselves once again, doing something creative. Um, You've mentioned you write poetry, readings, um, going out and seeing something that you haven't seen before. Perhaps it's a movie, perhaps it's a, a concert uh, a performance and a, a theater, etc. There are many ways to kind of gain um, from others as well. Not that you are looking to suck their energy too, mm-hmm. but it's a case that you have to be aware that there are individuals who essentially like being around you because you, you're just an up being and it can be quite draining. Mm-hmm. So what we're saying here is um, – it's very important to remember that self-preservation is, um, you know, a key to sustaining your mental well-being. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, there's something I wanted to ask you. It's gone. It will come back to me actually. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yes, this is it. Actually, it's come back to me now. Talking about um, the feelings that we have, because we are emotional beings, as we've said. Yeah. How do you know that you're feeling low as opposed to depressed? Mm. I think for me, the distinction between low and depression is about the length of time that the low mood continues for. When I have been working with individuals either in the criminal justice system or individuals that I see privately, it's about the the period of time that the low mood takes. And I think clinically we're looking at a depressed person around about two weeks to a good number of months Mm -hmm. that the low mood is just consistent no matter what happens for them they might have a a new child or might get married or a new job but the low mood continues i think at that point that's when we might want to have a conversation with a mental health professional and perhaps a gp uh, perhaps a psychiatrist to kind of understand essentially what is happening it might also be um something quite physical in terms of i was i was reading a story a few days ago about somebody who had um i think it was carbon monoxide in their space and there was a small gas leak and their boiler wasn't working very well and as a result of this boiler not working very well they had these depressive moods that were extending for a long period of time so there's something about situations yes and and places that can also bring about a low mood and perhaps it's just a case of being aware of these things Mm -hmm. that can influence us it might be somebody else it might be you know a relationship breakdown or a death in the family that also may have led us to feel low but it's about the length of time that the individual feels low for that then begins a distinction between low mood and depression. Okay. And um, you've, um, again, said something really important there, which is to um, seek, um, you know, the counsel of someone who's an expert in that field, you mm-hmm. know, because sometimes there is this taboo um, yeah. with feelings and thoughts that people have when actually there is help there. So, yeah. you know, go and seek um, help from a professional, as Michael mm-hmm. has said. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm. Michael, what yes. um, what are the first steps for someone who's thinking about a career in talking therapy or counselling? I think the first steps for me would be about a trial, a trial in terms of finding an introductory course anywhere. And you can find them online, you can find them at local colleges, you can find them at universities. Yeah. Mm. Any which way you can, perhaps finding a few books about the subject and perhaps doing a little bit of reading about what world you are getting yourself involved with. Right. Yeah. And and you spoke about, um, you know, the 
Laos, who you worked with in the prison, mm, yes, and um, you know your movement into the different uh, modalities in terms mm. of the holistic counselling. Mm. What, what kind of clients do you attract now, and how can people reach you? Okay, so the kind of clients I attract are just about anybody and everybody. Um, so. I think I've had a strong draw primarily because I am an African-Caribbean male. I've had a number of African-Caribbean males to to work with, um, as well as African-Caribbean females. But also, um, white males, white females, I'm open to anybody and everybody, how people can get a hold of me. um, My website, www.michaelforfiercounseling.com is where people can find me. I'm on Twitter, Therapy Forfier. Yeah, I'm I'm doing all of that stuff too, but not not as consistently as I had been a a couple of weeks ago, especially before I I listened to Get Off the Treadmill by Rebecca Gordon. (laughs) Thank you so much. (laughs) Now, I mean, uh, you've heard me say this probably two or three times already in the recording, but I'm so glad you've just said what you said, Michael, because we do know that um, there is a higher suicide rate amongst men. Mm. And uh, I mean, I interviewed Clive Maxey and his interview was right. why men need help too. Yeah. Yes. It was really, really insightful. Yes. Mm. But you've mentioned here African Caribbean males, mm. which um, I know in my coaching, I've had um, a lot of um, African Caribbean females predominantly mm. has been mm. my client group. Mm. And um, males have been sort of like quite limited, limiting mm. in the numbers who've come through the door. Although sure. I've had some younger males actually in their 20s, sure. 30s sure. who've taken up coaching, which I'm mm. in immensely proud of them for doing mm. so mm. but am i i mean can, can you share with me um is there more of a grown trend now for males and let's talk about african caribbean mm. males here mm. um to open up because i think historically you know it's sort of like you know don't go and talk your business out with somebody sure. else sure <laughs> sure yeah what, what yeah. are your thoughts on that I'm going to say yes, I'm going to be affirmative in that I feel that there is an upward trend in men seeking support and African-Caribbean males seeking support from others, as opposed to perhaps using other methods to um, balance low mood or balance anxiety. I think I'm I'm not going to name stuff, but essentially finding an, an another person to speak with is one way to begin a healing process for anybody and everybody but in particular i think there is a need um for black males to speak out about what's happening for them and we we can go into microaggressions that that individual might have experienced just riding a a tube train or subway train or a bus microaggressions are all around us and they affect us and they have an accumulative effect Mm -hmm. which then has a, a, a limited way of being supported especially if your family are tired of you always moaning on and on about a situation at work where you don't feel as valued or as respected as others that are getting the promotions or getting the jobs that essentially you are as qualified to get. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, they're just passing you by. There there are spaces um, where individuals can can go. I I think community centers used to be the place to go. Uh, But yeah, Mm -hmm. a a, a welcoming therapist would be also a a good place to go. Mm -hmm. A welcoming coach would also be a good place to go to voice these concerns. Uh, The other thing I just wanted to kind of bring in here, sorry, sorry, Rebecca, is that I, I think that I think for me, it's about the critical awareness of the individual to begin questioning, essentially, is this the status quo? How can I change it? How can I change aspects of myself to be better? Um, And if it is a case that I can go to a professional to seek that support, perhaps it's some reading that I need to do. Perhaps it's even a podcast that might begin the process for me to get 
a degree of, a degree of support that I haven't welcomed for myself. Mm. I really want to um, go into to schools, um, pupil referral units, etc., to just begin a conversation about critical thinking because I think that there is a, a paucity, a lack of critical thinking currently in our, our school systems that just perpetuate a certain way of being mm. that doesn't then invite change or creativity or collaboration. And it begins with the children. I really feel very strongly that actually we need to go down before we come up. Mm -hmm. So if you do have any educators listening or anyone, um, you know, at the head of that type of service, then um, please be in contact with Michael, who can, you know, um, talk to you a bit more about how he can support you to support the young people um, in your charge. For today's random thought, you'll need pen and paper. Do not drive or operate machinery when listening to this random thought and make sure you're in a safe place where you won't be disturbed. You'll also need to pause the recording at various stages so that you can work through the coaching tool. Don't worry, you'll recognise the natural pauses. So, when you're ready, let's get started. Today's random thought begins with a quote from an unknown author. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or use it for good. What I do today is important because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something that I have traded for it. I want it to be gain, not loss. Good, not evil. Success, not failure. In order that I shall not regret the price I paid for it. Sit, relax, and close your eyes. Think for a moment that time has moved on and it's one year on from today's date. Mentally, make a note of how old you are. In the 12 months that have gone by, things have drastically changed for you and your life has transformed even better than you had expected a year ago. Everything in your world is just great and a year on, you're living your best life. Take a moment to sense what's going on in this great new life experience. In your mind's eye, capture the pictures and sounds of life in the world that you have created. What's happening in your world? Who are you with? What work do you do? What's business like? How are your finances? What makes your love relationship so great? What's your physical environment like? Take a moment to reflect on this amazing life and when you're ready... Gently shake your fingers and wiggle your toes and gently open your eyes. Now at the top of a piece of paper, write the date a year from today. And take a moment to write down everything that's happening in your best life one year from today. Recall in your mind's eye the pictures, sounds, experiences and sensations that came forward. Now, write a statement that represents a goal you wish to achieve. At the top of a separate piece of paper, write down yesterday's date. 
List at least five to eight things that you did yesterday. They don't have to be in any particular order. Now take a good look at this list and put a star next to all the things that have a direct connection to your imagined life a year from now. Here's a question for you. Is your management of time in alignment with what you really want to do? This exercise may bring on a light bulb moment. It could be that you realise the things you're spending your time on have little or no relevance to your goals. Now, I want you to write down two things you'll do every day that will keep you aligned with your vision. And, most importantly, I want you to commit to doing the things you know will strengthen your connection to your personal goals. Thanks for listening to this random thought. I'm interested to know the difference that this random thought and coaching tool makes to your life. So please do reach out to me at info at satellitelifecoaching.com. With what you've just been saying, Michael, um, self-awareness is really, really important because sometimes you do have the feelings, you know, you, you have your interactions on a day-to-day basis with others and with the world, yeah. but it's about understanding what's going on um, and self-awareness. Absolutely. Um, and unless you're the recipient of that, you know, whether as an African Caribbean male or black male or an African mm-hmm. Caribbean or black female, yeah. unless you're, at the, you, you know, at the receiving end you wouldn't really get it really (laughs) you know um i did some research um yes a few probably about a year ago now for a course i was running Mm -hmm. and i although i know i've got my own experience of um you know all sorts of things that have happened to me in different environments also the workplace i didn't realize there was a term called the triple minority effect um, which is okay, you know, you've got the the, the ladder, the hierarchy, sure. and then you've got if you're you're, you're a, a, a male, you're a, a black male, you're mm. a black female, mm. and on top of that, you're a woman. You know, mm. so you've got mm. um, you know all those um, discriminations yeah. for, sure. for being a woman, yes. then for being um, a black woman, <laughs> you mm. know, and then for yeah. being wherever people want to think you are in society. Yeah. So before you actually even get into the workplace and do your job, mm-hmm. you know, as 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 a person of colour, you're mm. registering that subconsciously. Yeah. And then you've got Absolutely. all of that preloaded on top of whatever Absolutely. else is fanning yeah. around in the place. So yeah. people don't really understand unless you're feeling that. So it's yeah. great to know that there's someone like yourself as a yeah. black male, an African Caribbean male, mm. um, who's there and can offer the service. So um, Absolutely. I, I think that. one of the most powerful things that we can do to support ourselves is talk out and talk up about these issues. And I think for me, your your podcast is brilliant because it does address these issues. But there are others. There are so many others. Um, mel- melanin Millennials is one. Um, Broadwaters is another, as well as Code Switch, which is an American um American podcast that I listen to avidly, primarily because they are talking about issues that affect us all. Whether we be black or white, they affect us all. And it just feels like there is a a zeitgeist Mm, against talking out about these issues, but actually they affect each and every one of us in ways that perhaps we haven't even become aware of yet. Right. Okay. So before we go into the quick fire um, section of the show, um, I need to check with you because I know you are very productive and, um, you know, doing great service um, in the world. Mm. What goals do you have for the future? Wow. 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 I think that's a really interesting one. I I feel myself to be at a crossroads uh, in that 
I love what I'm doing. Um, working for Together has been, for the past two years, a really useful, um, brilliant, engaging experience. And I'm wondering how I can help the organization to formulate, especially along, along well-being lines, so that more people are attracted to this way of working, the, this way of working as a forensic mental health practitioner and working with surface users of probation, uh, prison, cr- the criminal justice system, and, and police stations, etc. Uh, that's just one aspect. Uh, I think there's also this idea around, or my idea about well-being in the workplace, that that I would like to kind of be a facilitator of so that individuals or organizations could buy in a degree of support from someone like myself to think around what actually can support an individual to have well-being so that sick days aren't taken as much by an individual or for a team of individuals who work for an organization. I I think there's also something here about um, a degree of negotiation and the being or the wanting to be collaborative in in work. And there are a number of systems that I absolutely am in love with called Scrum and Sprint Technologies, which really, they just are amazing in terms of how groups of people can come together and formulate new ways to problem solve and eradicate difficulties. Right. So I've, I've spoken about three or four different things here. Sorry, I've just got no. so many things I want to do. <laughs> I can hear your passion, Michael. That's great. <laughs> so you've mentioned Scrum and was that print technologies? Sprint, sprint oh, technology. Sprint. Yeah. Oh. Mm. And is this sort of like um, a therapeutic approach or project it, management? It, I, I the way I'm looking at it is that it's very systemic in how it addresses problems and difficulties in a work setting. And so you come together uh, with a group of individuals who are also facing the same level of difficulties and you kind of form a scrum and then you identify essentially who's going to kind of run the sprint. And the sprint could be over a week and you identify essentially how the issues are going to be tackled and who's going to tackle them and how soon they're going to be removed from essentially the blockage that the organization is experiencing so that you've you've kind of task managed something out of the way so there is a little bit more freedom a little bit more flow within the workspace i just think it's it's mind-blowing mind-blowing and yeah transformative right excellent okay um well certainly we have got this link now um, yes. which i will need to declare share with the world that we've established our link from linkedin <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> which was great some time ago and we yes. will keep up our connection so it'll be Absolutely. great to actually talk with you in the future Absolutely. about your developments with your projects mm. but for now michael Yes. What I'm going to do is invite you in to the quick fire um, section of the session. Okay. Are you ready for this? Yes, I'm ready. I'm okay, ready. Okay, great. Okay. So question number one. What's number one in your self-care routine? Giving thanks, uh, touching my stone and saying thank you to the universe for another day. Excellent. Question two. What's your word for 2017? I think I've got two, but I'll say this one, intersectionality, oh. which essentially is, I'll try and say this really quickly, about if you think about a, a, yeah, a crossroads, there are a number of intersections in it and there are a number of different ways you can go into or out of that cross. You can go back the way you came, you can go right, you can go left, you can go straight ahead. Or even if you go straight ahead, you can turn around and go back the way you came and take a left or a right. I love the word intersectionality. It means so much. Ooh. I'm actually writing a, a piece. It's just um, based on a trip to Spain that I did a few years back now. Um, but I, I, I'm picking mm. it back up again. And it's called Today I Climbed a Mountain. Mm. And it's about, um, you know, the rugged road and the the, path, sure. the clear pathway. So sure. that, 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 that word I can really identify with. Okay. <laughs> right. So that was right. one word. You said there were two. What's the other one? I forget. Sorry, I okay. forgot. It may, it may come back to me in it a second. It may come back. Okay. It may come back. Okay. So let me ask you then, how is the word 
intersectionality working for you already this year? I think for me, it has been about experiences and there have been a number. Yesterday, I did some mental health training for around about 50, alongside a colleague, around about 50 police officers. Mm. And so I'm, I'm quite confident that as a result of doing that training, more work will come either through to me or through the organization together nice. and there will be a, a a good degree more intersectionalities for the organization to kind of express and expose what mental health is and work with organizations I, i'm sure that's what's going to be coming yes. next week I, yeah. next week i'm going to be doing some training for the british, british transport police also around mental health okay uh, I've mm-hmm. I've done two trainings for University of East London on mental health and the intersections of criminality and mental health or mental well-being. So, yeah, it's already begun. It's already here. Yes, that's good. Yeah. Mm. And it's um, that word then, and just you putting that word into con- context. Mm. Your life is a great adventure. It's so exciting, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> it feels that way. It yeah, does feel it does. Way. I'm yeah. guessing that energy as well. That's that's great. Mm. I'm really pleased for you. Okay. Thank you. So, Thank question you. number three then: What important lesson has life taught you that might help the listener right now? Okay, so I'm just going to key this back. Um, In 2011, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and it was a big hit for me, primarily because I knew something was wrong, but I didn't have a diagnosis, so I couldn't kind of figure what it was about. And whilst it did take me down into a low spell for a, a period of months, I was able to climb out of it. And how I climbed out of it is I just kind of got on with it. And many people in the prison have always said, yeah, how are you doing? I'm just getting on with it. And and that's essentially been my, my marker, my my word, my, my nom de jour. I love saying that because it just inspires me to continue. No matter what difficulties I might face, I'm just going to get on and get over it. Mm. A great message there. Mm. So, Michael, um, you've sent me the YouTube um, link to your walking and talking counseling practice yes. video. I thought yes. that was a fantastic video. It's on your short Thank clip, you. but Thank very, you. very deep, very powerful. Thank you. So Thank I will you. share that on the um, description um, show page. Marvellous. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, Michael, it's been an immense pleasure connecting with you again in the coaching lounge. Um, what are your final Super. comments you. that you'd like to share with the world? Um, I loved this interview. Um, I think there's a lot that could be said about therapists uh, who can write something about themselves and put it out there, primarily because it dispels any myths or any stigmas that could be had or held in the general public's eye about what mental health and what mental well-being is great organization i'll mention this last thing i'm going to say is there's an online magazine called the counselors cafe um i've met with both dion and victoria and we've had a number of conversations about what it means for a therapist but also members of the public to write in about their experiences with mental well-being and mental illness That's yeah. brilliant. So yeah. people can actually just type in into the browser that Counselors Cafe, yeah, and they can yeah, actually the participate. Cafe. That's Absolutely. really good. Yes, they can. I will yeah. have a look at that. Mm. Michael Opoko Fofie, it's been a superb pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased that we've Thank had you, this Rebecca. interview today, Thank and you. Um, we will speak again very soon. Thank you very much, and good luck with everything. tuning into the coaching lounge join us next time for more insightful interviews with inspiring guests you can hear previous shows on soundcloud by searching for satellite life coaching we're always interested to hear your feedback and topic suggestions so don't hesitate to email us on info at satellite